Hey, thank you for joining me. Hope you're doing well. This is Devin Maggi from the Flat Earth Paradise channel, and I'm here to bring you today a little presentation on Flat Earth's North Pole. And indeed, we are going to be talking from the ground up why this is the Garden of Eden, Hyperborea, an ethereal landscape of the heart and soul, which myself and thousands of others have our eyes set upon. Now, I gave this lecture a few weeks ago, so I'm going to give it once again on the internet. So, as we all know, uh, this is the Gleason model of the Flat Earth. Many people do not subscribe to this model, and I don't necessarily, but all I'm concerned about is the center. So, for all sakes and purposes, we will be using this model in this presentation. Uh, it might not be accurate, but again, I am focused on the center. So the center is the North Pole, and the outer ice ring is what we would call the South Pole. Now in various maps from the late 1800s to the early 1900s, Gleason actually produced flat earth maps, and many of which were in textbooks and all across classrooms in the United States. And what's curious about them is the center is completely open, and many of them have a sort of opening or void space at the center. Now, the first question I have to ask, which we're going to be answering pretty soon, is why do compasses point north? The standard explanation on a globe Earth is that a south polarity is always attracted to the north polarity of a magnet. So this is why whether you're in the north or south pole, uh, your compass needle will always point north. Well, you would think it would be the other way around. If there are two sources of magnetism in this realm on Earth, then when you're in the southern hemisphere, your compass would point south. This is indeed a bullshit explanation. And many of these globe earthers and uh, those who preach scientism, we notice that there are always explanations that need further processing. At first, gravity does not make sense, but over time you repeat it enough, then the complexity becomes the truth. Now, I don't know about you, but I subscribe to the idea that the devil is in the details. So if an explanation seems more complex than it should be, it probably is not based in truth. Now, this is uh, a model of what many would say are the lands beyond the ice wall, the Antarctic ice wall. This is a uh, supposed Tibetan map that was found. We are not sure if there are lands beyond the ice wall, but there may be. And whether or not this is the case, I'm here to inform you. This is a red herring. The Antarctic ice wall is furthest away on what we'd call Earth from the magnetic center, from the, this toroidal field. And as we'll be showing, the closer you are to this source, the more holy and sacred, non-dual and pure of a people's and land. This is. But Devin, we already know what's at the Arctic. Uh, <laughs> there's no mystery. Well, there is indeed a mystery. I mean, there are ambiguous sheets of ice that are illustrated on many globe maps, on many uh, ice illustrations of the Arctic, and all of them are, are, are different. They're all completely different. In fact, on Google Maps, we don't even see an ice sheet. We just see water. We see a spot uh, of ocean. And this is strange. This is very, very strange. So what are they hiding? What's also curious is if you look at flight paths, none of them go over the Arctic Circle. Some of them 
are in the borders of the Arctic Circle, but as you can see, uh, many quite inconveniently <laughs> will go around this area. Now this doesn't really make sense, especially when you're going from, uh, you know, the US to Russia or something like that. And well, this is because there is a giant hole or crater or vortex at the North Pole. I'm about to show you some images, but I first must talk about what soft disclosure is. So soft disclosure is a form of disclosure in which the powers that be reveal occulted information by strategically placing it in public view. This could be on random images online, this could be in video games, movies, web pages, what have you. Soft disclosure is what we call hidden in plain sight. So keep that in mind when we're looking at the following images. These are indeed CGI. These are indeed CGI photos released from NASA, but they have a purpose. They are here to reveal the North Polar Vortex. Uh, you can do a, a, a Google search of North Pole Hole and you will find these very images. Some were said to be taken by satellite, some were taken by the actual space station, uh, some are taken by the Russian Mir station. It's very, very interesting. Very interesting. Now you might say, I can get behind Flat Earth. Flat Earth is provable. We can observe the lack of curvature. We can define the bunk physics that have been handed down to us through Copernicus and Newton and Einstein and we can observe flight paths and deem the Earth to be an immovable flat plane. But you might say, I cannot get behind a theory that says there is a sacred land at the center through a vortex. Well, to that I have to say, time to get out of the materialist, reductionist perspective of the world. This is the most pervasive uh, worldview on earth right now and it's one that is responsible for the spiritual degradation we've seen in these dark ages and what it is is a toxic philosophy which says all that exists is ultimately physical what I cannot see cannot exist if I cannot sense something with my five senses I won't believe it now this is vastly Toxic. This is vastly toxic because uh, we are divine multidimensional creators. Collectively, we are responsible for all creation. We are tied to the ether and the black sun, which we'll get to later in this conversation. So many of you guys have seen this image. This is a compilation of some ancient cosmologies and cultures which knew and depicted the earth as flat, as a flat realm, oftentimes with a firmament, a dome on top. And I want to show this because much of what I'm doing is using ancient knowledge and reincorporating it into this age. So everything I'm saying is not new. It has been indeed occulted, but it's not new. Uh, this is ancient knowledge. This is ancient wisdom. And funny enough, in The Ancient Wisdom by Jeffrey Ash, he writes, In the far north, there is a high and paradisal place, peopled by an assembly of beings of superhuman longevity and wisdom. This is the place where Earth rises to join the celestial center, the pole of heaven. So what is the pole of heaven? Well, this is the center point. It's what we'd call the axis mundi. Uh, sometimes it is a world tree. Sometimes it is a tree of life. Sometimes it's just an ambiguous world pillar. And the axis mundi is the connection between heaven and earth in certain beliefs and cosmologies. And we're going to go through a few. Here's the Germanic cosmology of the earth. We see the central pillar Ermensol. Here is an artistic depiction of Ermensol. 
Here is the Persian perspective of the earth, and at the center we have Mount High Hera. And this depiction is actually in, including an ice wall. So High Hera is at the center at the North Pole. The Norsemen knew the earth was flat and had Yggdrasil, the cosmic tree of life, at the center. The Navajos knew the earth was flat with a center axis. Here's Mayan cosmology. They had a, a sacred pyramid at the center. Here is the Babylonian depiction of the earth. They had something quite similar. And then we get to Vedic co cosmology. And this is what we would call Bhu Mandala. Bhu Mandala is the Vedic illustration of the universe. And at the center of Bhu Mandala, underneath the pole star, is Mount Sumeru, or Mount Maru. This is the cosmic mountain in Hindu mythology, and it bridges the heavens, earth, and the hellish realms. At the base of Mount Maru, it is quite physical, and the higher up you go, the more ethereal this mountain becomes. It is hundreds of thousands of miles tall, and it is the abode of demigods in the Hindu religions. At top is the castle of Brahma. This is Brahma's golden abode. Now, everything is a microcosm of the macrocosm. Everything is a reflection of everything else. We are inside of a fractal. We are God fractalized. And everything we observe is a part of this source energy that's been fractalized. So it's no coincidence that all creation always funnels to the center. You can look at any pattern in nature. There is always a center point from which everything branches out from. And this is what the North Pole is. It is the cradle of humanity. It is the starting point. It is the, the place where we begin and where we will return to. And in my opinion, we are about to return to this sacred land, to the origin point. Here we are seeing the flower of life. The flower of life is a geometrical form, and it's said to act as the template from which all life springs. So again, everything starts at the center point and branches outwards. Now, Mount Maru is at the center of a four-continent system. We are told that we live in the southern continent right now. Any modern-day cosmologist, Vedic cosmologist, will tell you that Earth is Jambadvipa, that the globe Earth is Jambadvipa. This makes no sense. When you're looking at this model and you think that Earth is Jambadvipa, it's quite easy to write this off as a bogus myth, and the ancients were out of their mind, and they, and, and they created a fantastically crazy story about where we are in the universe. Well, I'm saying this four-continent system is at the center. It's at the North Pole. This four-continent system is not new. In fact, in 1595, we can see this four-continent system at the Arctic, illustrated by Gerhard Mercator, who was a 16th century Flemish cartographer, and he was actually quite famous in his time. In fact, we still use what's called the Mercator projection for all of our school maps. He wrote to John Dee a letter in 1577, and from it I quote, in the midst of the four countries is a whirlpool into which there empty these four indrawing seas which divide the north. Right under the pole, there lies a bare rock in the midst of the sea. Its circumference is almost 33 French miles, and it is all of magnetic stone. What he's referring to is this center rock, which he titled the Rupes Nigra et Altissima, the black and very high rock. Now, instantly, we make the connection to Mount Maru at the center, to Hyhera at the center, to the Germanic Ermensoul. 
it is the same story over and over again. And a giant magnetic rock at the North Pole, well, this would indeed explain why all compasses point north effortlessly, wherever you are on this plane. We see four rivers, four rivers which uh, converge at the center to what he called an indrawing sea. I have to make the connection. There were four heads of one river that went out from Eden in the Garden of Eden story in Genesis. Of course, the next line of scripture states that this is the Euphrates River and this is the Tigris. And these are all rivers which currently exist in the Middle East. Well, for those of you who have been watching my channel, you know that all history is his story. Many religious texts, historical accounts, etc. have been conveniently changed or switched around as to confuse the masses, as to not reveal occulted knowledge. So why is it crazy to believe that these rivers, uh, which do exist in the Middle East, were simply inserted into the story? Now, if this was the only map of the Arctic with four continents, we could easily write it off as fiction, as a fairy tale. But no, from the 1400s to the mid-1600s, almost all world maps contained a four-continent system with what appears to be a giant rock or mountain at the center. And in some of them, like this one, I mean, it's a huge system. We see the four rivers, we see the rock at the center. I mean, this is quite a large area of land which has been taken out of the public eye. And not only were they European maps, but they were also Asian maps. And so around the world, these four continents were drawn. This is an undated map from the Arctic, but it shows at the center what's labeled Hyperborea. Now, we don't see the rock at the center, we don't see the four rivers, but we do see that Ilixoa, which is Greenland, uh, we see Iceland right next to it, and to the right we can see the land of Scythia. Now, Scythia was a part of Russia. And we'll get to that in a little bit. Here we can see four islands at the center. This is kind of a strange map. But these four continents were deleted from maps almost overnight in the late 1600s. Very strange. And not only were they deleted, but they were completely taken out along with parts of Canada, Greenland, and Russia. In fact, it's almost like there was a shitty Photoshop job done in this area. They just completely took it out. Now, in Celtic mythology, there is a group of demigods called the Tuatha de Danann, and it's said that they came from the northern islands of the world, and this is where they were instructed in the magic arts. Uh, these four island cities were called Murius, Phalius, Gorius, and Findius. So it's very interesting that uh, not only do we have the four continents surrounding Mount Meru, not only do we have the four island cities in, this, uh, in these northern islands of the world, but we also have what's called the Isles of the Immortals, which is seen in Chinese mythology. Now, it's said that these were four floating islands. The Japanese called this North Polar Area the Island of the Congealed Drop. And as we can see in the Japanese depiction of the world, at the center is Mount Shumisen. Surrounding Mount Shumisen are seven rings of golden mountains. So now we get to Shambhala. This land has many names. One of my favorite names for it is Shambhala. It is the Tibetan Buddhist land 
where only the pure of heart can live. It's a place where love and wisdom reigns, where people are immune to suffering, want, and old age. And what's interesting is it says that it's shielded from the outside world by snow mountains. And I can't help to draw parallels to the mountains which surround in the Mercator maps. Very similar to the Tibetan Buddhist uh, land of, Sh of Shambhala, in Tibetan Ban cosmology, at the center of their universe is Yang Drung Gutsek, which is in a land called Tagzig Olmo Lung Ring, which is literally the same thing as Shambhala just in this different culture. And what's interesting is that the texts do say that four rivers flow from Yang Drung Gutsek. The center is the Holy Grail. There have been many books written on the Holy Grail, this chalice of immortality in Arthurian legend that uh, demonstrates and represents and reveals the hero's ultimate journey. The quest for the Grail is the path towards enlightenment. It's the path towards purity. And anybody who drinks from the Holy Grail achieves immortality and abundant youth and happiness. And as we can see, and as, as I've said multiple times, the center of a round flat table contains the Holy Grail in almost all medieval artwork. And this is because we are living on a round flat earth where at the center exists a Holy Grail. And, and what's interesting is there is actually a sort of hole at the center of this table. And why is this? Well, grail comes from the word gradalis, which comes from the Latin crotalis. Crotalis means crater. So finally, I show our model of what we think the North Pole looks like. This model is not to scale, but we believe there is a crater going into these four island continents at the center. Now, many of you may be looking at this and be wondering, well, that's fine, but uh, it seems like they have a curve there. How can any peoples exist in a crater which is slanted downwards? And what I have to say to that is, this is not affected by the same physicality as on these outer lands. This sacred realm, this realm within our realm, is the source of magnetism. And thus, everything there acts in a different way. There are giants in many of the tales of Hyperborea. There is giant fruit. And why is this? Because the closer you get to magnetism, the larger things become. And the over-physical properties we see on these outer lands is not here. This is semi-physical, semi-ethereal. And so it's closer to the ether realm. Manifestation is quicker. It is a five-dimensional land. So to think that this model is strange, we must get out of the materialist, reductionist perspective. I mentioned Hyperborea. Hyperborea is the ancient Greek land beyond the north wind. And it's even said in the mythology that it indeed was underneath the North Pole, past the Riphian Mountains. What are the Riphian Mountains? Well, we go back to this undated, unnamed Hyperborean map. Uh, it's said that on the borders of Scythia lay the Riphian Mountains. And past that is Hyperborea. Pliny the Elder in Natural History in 77 AD actually wrote something parallel. He said, Within a little are the Riphian Mountains and a country called Terra Forris, for the resemblance of wings occasioned by the continual fall of snow, a part of the world condemned by the nature of things and immersed in thick darkness having no sheltering places but the work of cold, the produce of the freezing north wind. Beyond those mountains and beyond the North Pole, 
There is a happy nation whom they call Hyperborea, who live exceedingly long and are celebrated for fabulous wonders. There are believed to be the poles of the world and the very ends of the revolution of the heavens, having for six months together one entire day and night as long. So this is interesting. It is actually stating that one day there is like six months out here. And many of the accounts say this same thing. And this is because space and time dilates. The closer you get to the center, it's said that in the Norse paradisal land called Asgard, time moves very slowly. And what's interesting, if we go back, we can see Pliny says beyond the North Pole, this is where Hyperborea is. Well, how does this make sense? Beyond the North Pole, that almost sounds like an ambiguous area. You know, is it east, west of the North Pole? Where is it? Well, this is why it only makes sense that there is a vortex or crater that you must go beyond in order to enter this sacred land. Now, if we look at the etymology of Hyperborea, it literally means beyond Boreas. Boreas is actually the, uh, the Greek analog of the Demiurge, the Gnostic Demiurge who bound uh, Sophia into matter. I'm not going to go into this right now, but if those are curious, you can go back and watch my video called Sophia the Black Sun. But we can also observe Boreas is very similar to Borealis. So Hyperborea is literally beyond where the Aurora Borealis is coming from, which we're going to get to in a second. The Aurora Borealis is the sacred astral light of the Akashic records that comes from the center. And here I quote Pythias of Phocia. Yes, I dreamed the endless day in a golden light. I am so eager to turn the prow of my ship toward the north. At the top of the island of Britain to the north, the days last more than 20 hours in the summertime. From there, I must go to the throne of the sun. I want to go to Hyperborea, where I am at the top of the world, and I understand the beauty of the highest numbers. I want to go to the Hyperboreans. Why does Pythias say, I must go to the throne of the sun. Well, the center is the throne of the sun. After all, it is the origin point. It's said in the Greek mythologies that each autumn, Apollo would leave Greece to spend wintertime in Hyperborea. He would be on his winged chariot pulled by pure white swans. And when he arrived there, he would spend his time dancing and feasting in Hyperborea, where there were temples built for Apollo. Now, Apollo is the late Greek personification of the sun. So this story is actually an allegory. So it said each autumn, Apollo, the sun, would leave to spend winter time in Hyperborea. Many of you have probably seen this. This is the path of the sun on our flat realm. And as we can see, it spirals in and out from the center. And on December 21st, when the sun is at its lowest strength, its lowest point in the sky, it is directly over the North Pole. So again, each autumn, Apollo would leave. This means beginning in autumn, the sun begins its descent towards the center. Now, this story of Apollo is also seen in the ancient Babylonians, and they called the center vortex Bab-Elu, the gate of God. And it's said in the text that when the sun enters Bab-Elu at the winter solstice, December 21st, he starts his journey northward. So December 21st, the sun is at the lowest point in the sky. And from there, he can only increase in power. Now, at the center is the black sun. The black sun is the counterpart of the white sun. They are two expressions of the same entity. And the Egyptians knew this, and they personified them 
in the dual entity Amun-Ra. Amun being the black sun and Ra being the white sun. Most of us are familiar with Ra, which the Egyptians even say is the sun. Amun, however, is quite a mystery. Amun was the primeval creator, the indivisible creator. From him sprang Ra. So this is the black sun, Amun. This is why we say Amen after many of our prayers, because we're acknowledging that our intent is going to Amun, to the black sun. Now, we can read between the lines of deception because we can see in photos of black holes that NASA gives us, behind it is white light. In photos of the sun by NASA, again, fake, but still quite revealing. We see blackness hiding behind the light. This is no coincidence. The white sun is powering all of our conscious reality. You know, our bodies, nature. It's giving off this prana which becomes external matter. However, the black sun has the opposite job. It is connected to us in the opposite way. It processes all intense thoughts, feelings, uh, goals, desires. And again, it's why we say Amen at the end of our prayers. This is Amun, the Black Sun. Many of you are familiar with the song Black Star by David Bowie. Go ahead and watch the music video. It's pretty telling. And we actually see the Black Sun in this video, which is emitting the Aurora Borealis. And if we read some of the lyrics, it states, In the Villa of Ormond stands a solitary candle in the center of it all, in the center of it all. We're in the Villa of Ormond right now, the Villa of All Men. We have to get to this solitary candle. And it's quite interesting that he says candle because Shambhala, the etymology of Shambhala actually means divine candle or elevated candle. This is what Sham means. Sham means candle or light, and Bala means elevated or divine. Now, now in the mid-1800s, there actually is an account that came out called The Smoky God, in which a sailor named Olaf Jansen and his father actually went to this place. From it, I quote, My father was an ardent believer in Odin and Thor, and had frequently told me they were gods who came from far beyond the north wind. There was a tradition, my father explained, that still farther northward was a land more beautiful than any mortal man had ever known, and that it was inhabited by the, the Chosen. What they found there was amazing. They found giant vegetation, uh, peaceful giants, a race of beings who were always laughing, who were always partaking in music and praise for the gods, and everybody was on the path of purity there. There was no disharmony to be noticed in the entire stay. And they even had houses. They have houses and uh, industries that are quite similar to these outer lands. But like Olaf Jansen suggests, these are not destructive. These are compatible with nature, with Gaia. Many of you have heard, especially from hollow earth circles, that Rear Admiral Byrd in the 1920s flew into the North Polar opening as an accident. Uh, and from his diary, he actually said, I'd like to see that land beyond the pole. The area beyond the pole is the center of the great unknown. He wrote this about 20 years after his trip there. And we actually have an audiobook done by an ex-North SEAL member, which I suggest you check it out. This is from his diary, and he details flying saucers there. He details woolly mammoths, and just like Olaf Jansen, Giants, a peaceful race. Now, man is a microcosm of the macrocosm. 
And I say this because it means everything we are is representative of the realm we're in. If, if we look at the energy field around us, we see that there is a toroidal field emerging and converging at the heart, from the heart. And why is this? Well, because the heart of the earth is the origin point, and we must get to the heart. We must open up the green rays of our hearts, which is, like I always say, the same color as the aurora borealis. This is a chakra chart, and I'm giving this just to basically detail where we want to be. Those who are on Earth are sort of in limbo. Earth is an anagram for heart. But this does not guarantee that from Earth we will ascend or incarnate into higher realms. The heart chakra is the bridge from the material to the spiritual. If one does not activate their heart, one cannot ascend to higher realms. So I want you to think of a flat plane right now, and you're looking at it uh, from a sideways angle. We're told many stories of reptilians and all of these non-human entities. Some of them come from, in my opinion, beyond the ice wall, but many of them come from underground, come from the lower realms. And these are realms that have to do with the solar plexus, the root chakra, the, uh, the sexual chakra, the sacral chakra. These chakras have to do with power, security, sex, greed. The point of all of this is not, let's get to the center. It sounds like a paradise. It sounds like an amazing place. Indeed it is, but it is a pure place. It is a non-dual location. We put ourselves in these outer lands. Our actions throughout the multiverse, whatever happened in the so-called past, that has placed us in these outer lands. Now, if we want to make it into the center, past Heimdallr, past the Flaming Sword, we will not only take the external journey to get there, either on foot, by boat, perhaps by plane, but we must take an inward journey. We must spend time in solitude. We must rediscover our divinity. We must cleanse our bodies. We must purify our thoughts. We must not go towards extremes. And we must observe total cooperation with Source. Because while everything comes from source, not everything is of source. And it's more than possible that through disharmonious tendencies, we can become, and many al already have, so disconnected from the nourishing light of source that we essentially become programs within this earth matrix. We essentially become archons, demons. However, there are still many living souls who have not completely fragmentized uh, their higher selves. They remain seekers. They remain journeyers of the heart. They remain attentive to what the Great Mother, what Gaia is offering in this golden age that we're just on the brink of getting to. And these are the beings who will be going to the Garden of Eden. And how this looks, it's not certain. But we have to get there. And this is why I have uh, started the North Seal Project. And what this is, is this is meant to facilitate our polar return to this sacred land. One person is all it takes. One person will create an etheric link from these outer lands to the center. And what this will do, I cannot say. But what I can say is the North Seal Project is here to uh, inspire 
and navigate our way into the Garden of Eden. To get there, we must navigate by the stars. We must find where the North Star is and go in that direction. The North Star Polaris is at the center of our flat plane, and directly below it is the North Pole. If we look at the constellation the Big Dipper, uh, its movement throughout the year creates what looks like a swastika. It's therefore no coincidence that the swastika is the most ancient symbol. It is pervasive throughout almost every ancient culture in the world. And why is this? Well, this is because the land underneath the swastika is the holiest of all pursuits. Now, I'm going to end this with some wordplay. The center is a land where we must enter. Compass, the word compass is begging us to come pass to where the compass needle is pointing to. And porthole is an anagram for North Pole. Now, a porthole as we know it these days, it means uh, an airplane window. However, the Scottish root port actually means gate. So it's a hole that is a gate. It is a gateway. And of course, porthole is very similar to portal. So thank you everybody for watching. I hope this has inspired many of you. If you're new to my channel, please check out uh, my in-depth presentations. I've been conducting research over the past year on this area and I will not stop. However, my research is almost coming to an end because the devil, like I said at the beginning, is in the details. So it's not about uh, how much scripture we can quote. It's not about how many references we can find. It's not even how many proofs we make. It's about how the external journey combines with the internal journey, how the esoteric merges with the exoteric. So the point of all of this is to expand our consciousness. It's to redefine what being a human being is. And on that note, I wish all of you a beautiful day, and I love you all.